it's truly a great honor to be asked to bring the word in a church like this. My dad was a pastor for many years, and it's a huge responsibility for a man to stand and bring the word every week. And you don't hand that lightly to someone else or to someone. It's a, an expression of trust that you would allow someone to stand and to bring the word before a congregation. And I'm blessed with a wonderful family that uh, my wife and five children that are not only a great blessing to me, but they are my spiritual barometer. So they will monitor the things that I say this morning, and if there's an inconsistency between what I say and what I do, then I'll get to hear about it on the car ride home today. But that's a good thing. That's, that's a gift. And I want to apologize in advance to people in the AV booth because normally when I come to teach, I like to have things very organized, and yet I have not uh, been completely at peace. I've, I've got my kids heard, they said, Daddy, you've only got 30 minutes, and look at all those pages you've got. But I don't know what I'm going to teach, except I know that uh, my prayer is that it would be from the Holy Spirit. And I was thinking as we are worshiping this morning, and I deeply appreciate the, the ministry that Pastor Jason has here, and what a tremendous gift to be able to worship the Lord in this way. Now, we worship in a culture where the primary language, the, the only language, is not English. And it's hard to, to express yourself in that context when it's not your language. And so it's a special privilege for us to be in the United States and to worship again in our mother tongue and to enjoy that with you. Now, I'm not going to tell you this morning stories about Mongolia. And the reason I'm not going to do that is because that makes us seem separate, and we're not. And it's, um, it's hard to stand before you in one regard because you don't know me and you don't know my family, and I can give you an impression that's completely unreal. And I don't know you, and I don't know the challenges you face. And so I might be telling you things that, uh, that are not exactly what you need to hear, but I pray that the things that uh, the Holy Spirit gives would be an encouragement to you and also a challenge to you. I'm reminded of what uh, one pastor said. He said, a pastor's job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And there's some sense in which that's very true. But see, I don't speak as an authority. I am not qualified to be an orderly to the great physician. However, the great physician has given us his book of diagnosis to explain to us what we need to understand so that we can be right with him spiritually. One of the things that my family hopes to do while we're in the United States this summer is to have checkups because medical care is not really good where we are. And you know, we only do that every couple of years. And when we go to the doctor, the doctor looks at us and he checks our blood pressure and our pulse and looks at our blood chemistries and tells us if there's something of concern and some changes that we may need to make in our lifestyle in order to take care of the bodies that God has given us. And there's a sense in which that's what church is for us. It's a place where we come and we take our spiritual temperature and we see where we have grown cold and where we have gone to excess, where we are out of sync with the Holy Spirit, where we need to get things back in line. And I pray that the Lord would use the word this morning to do that. So I am just, as, as one pastor has said, I am one beggar telling other beggars where I have found bread. You see, missions, when we think of missions, we think of people on foreign fields. And I mentioned that there's a danger with that. And the danger is that what I call the out there factor. Oh, you, you work in Mongolia. That's out there. Well, that separates it from us. That makes missions seem like something that is far apart from us. But the reality is, I like what John Piper has said. He said, missions exists because worship doesn't. Missions exists because worship doesn't. So wherever there is 
a lack of worship or an absence of worship, there needs to be missions. You see, when we get to stand before Jesus in eternity, there will not be missions anymore. Those who are Christ's will have been gathered together with him. And those who are separated from him will be that way eternally, which is why we need missions today. And so the reality is that missions exists not only in Mongolia and China and Afghanistan and all the other countries that we think of as out there. Missions exists in the United States and in liberal Kansas because there are people who need to be worshiping the Father who aren't. We need to be protected from the idea of marginalizing missionaries. Oh, I could never do that. That may make you feel like what you do is second best, and that's not true. My wife gave an article to me a couple of weeks ago, and there was a quote in that article that I liked so well. It said that the choice to usher in the kingdom of God deserves respect wherever it takes place. And that doesn't just happen on Sunday mornings. We have had the privilege of being recipients of incarnational ministry. Ministry with flesh and bones on it with Pastor Lauren and his wife Catherine who just exemplify Christ in the way they open their home to others. I mean, here they are, a man with the same size family as mine. So when I walked through the door, doubled the size of his family. He went from 7 to 14. And, you know, I would think that was a great generosity. But then, you know, you wake up in the morning and there are more than 14 beds. And you look and you see, oh, well, they welcomed these people in because they needed, they welcomed these people. And I'm amazed. And he, most of the time, he had a smile on his face. You know, that's what ministry is about. It's about opening our lives to others. And so, being a missionary includes things like talking to people about Jesus on the streets. But it is having people in your home. Eating a meal with them. It's having people over to watch a movie and talk about it together. It may be giving somebody a bed to sleep in when they don't have a place to rest or when home is a long way off and they can't get there tonight. And that's the kind of ministry that we've seen today. And you know, we've got missionaries in all kinds of places. And missionaries are those who are uniquely gifted to reach people where they live. I was thinking about some friends of ours who live in Indiana. This man and his wife came from a rough background. And they have started dairy farming with goats and they produce specialty cheeses and produce and artisan breads and they sell these at the farmer's market and they use their farm as an outreach to children who struggle to connect with people but identify with the animals and I think that Jedediah and Erica Martin have a unique ability to connect with people that will never come to church on Sunday morning they are missionaries in Indiana And then I think about liberal Kansas. And I thought, you know, you guys have missionaries here at National Beef. People who go in and have relationships with other workers that will never darken the door of a church on their own. But they can see Christ lived out with them on a daily basis. When others cheat the clock, they see the Christian and the way that they're living. When others use foul language and tell foul stories, they see what the Christian does, and they're looking for the consistencies or the inconsistencies. You know, Jesus said about the people of Israel in his day, he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This morning, we have honored God with our lips. And my question is, where are your hearts? Where is my heart? Is it with the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who called me into existence and the one who by his own sacrifice made me his own to live with him eternally? Or am I thinking about dinner, about a car I want to buy, a house I want to build? If you remember, if you look in in the book of Revelation chapter 2, there are seven churches that John talks about there that are a picture of the church at any time in history, both the church as it should be 
and the church where it's struggling. And that's, we need to, to see where we are in that picture. And the, the church that I think of the most often is the, the church at Ephesus, the first church that John writes about. And he talks about all these wonderful things that they have done, that they have defended the faith, that they've been faithful. But then Jesus says, but this one thing you lack, you've lost your first love. You've allowed something else to displace me as your number one priority. And I think the church in America, we struggle with that because God has blessed us with so much that we get lost in the stuff and we, we get so busy doing things for Christ that we forget to love Christ. You know, we have the picture of Mary and Martha in the New Testament. We need to be like Mary, who delight, delighted in sitting at Jesus' feet. Martha was doing good things, but she lost sight of the main thing, the main one who was right there with them that she needed to be worshiping and enjoying Jesus while he was there with her. And we need to be doing the same thing. So let me, uh, let me try to, to bring this in, and we'll talk just a little bit. So the, the things that I was thinking about this morning were the nature of missions, that we are all missionaries, and then what are we living for? What's the main thing that we want out of life? I talk to my students sometimes, and I ask them, at the beginning of each semester, I ask them, why are you taking this class? Why are you going to the university? And usually they'll tell me it's because they want a peaceful life, because they want to be successful, because they want to go on and have a good career. But you know, the reality is that every one of us wants at our heart to be fulfilled. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly to the full. We all want full lives. And to be full, fulfilled, means that we don't feel like we're lacking anything. I haven't missed out. And that's what I want for my life. And I'm sure it's what you want for your life. And the world says, I want to be happy. In fact, uh, there's this universal need that we have to be happy. One, I've got a quote. I don't know if, if we've got it up there. There's a quote from a mathematician named Blaise Pascal. And he said it this way. He said, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it, it's the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step, but to this object, this motive, the motive to be happy, is behind every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. And if you understand that everything we do drives toward becoming happy, then the question is, what is that thing that makes us happy? This need that we have, it's actually a God-given need. Jesus talks about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You know, that's a God-given need. If you weren't hungry for the things of God, you wouldn't seek after them. God puts that hunger in your heart so that you will seek after him. But you know, we have an enemy out there, and the enemy is working to try to get you to satisfy that need in some way other than the way that God wants you to satisfy it. The Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion roaming about seeking whom he may devour. And the way he devours often is by diverting us, turning us away from the ideal place. For example, we were driving here the other day, and we were taking, I think it's Highway 54400, coming down from Wichita to come to Liberal. And you know, there's uh, a place... I can't remember the town where it's just outside of Greensburg, I think, where 54 and 400 split. You know, they're going together from Wichita down for a long way, and then they split. And if I had stayed on 400, no matter how sincere I was, I would not have gotten to liberal. Thank God he gave my wife a much better sense of direction than I have. So she told me the way I was supposed to turn. But you see, we can start in the right direction, and then we get just a little way off, but that road can go farther and farther away, and we don't even realize 
that we're wandering away from where we need to be headed. So make, we need to make sure that we are seeking our satisfaction, our happiness, in the one place where it can be fulfilled. You see, the world's way is to say adventure is out there somewhere. If you saw the movie Up from Walt Disney several years ago, that was the message that was at the beginning of the film. Adventure is out there. You read storybooks, and there, there's always some adventure that people are going on. The problem is, what about the people who can't go on their adventures out there? They can't afford it. Maybe they have a handicap. Maybe there's some other limitation that keeps them from it. When God offered water to the woman at the well, if you remember Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, which was a shocking thing in those days, not only for a man to be talking but to a woman, but for a Jew to be talking to a Samaritan. He told her, he said, whoever drinks of the water I give him will have within him a well of living water springing up. Whoever. The Christian message is not limited to those who are young and beautiful and rich. The Christian message is available to anyone who will come and drink. But you see, the world's way is very different. The world is giving us either a misdiagnosis, telling us the wrong thing that's wrong with us, or it's giving us the wrong treatment more often than not. And I thought of the example. If you've got a terrible headache, and you're able to take some strong medicine, and it gets rid of that headache, you feel better. But what if that headache is caused by a tumor? You see, you haven't really dealt with the underlying issue. You've solved what the problem on the surface, but the thing that will kill you is still there. And that's the world's way. That's Satan's way. Let's satisfy them a little bit to keep them from dealing with the real issue. Or what if you've got a stomach ache that is caused by appendicitis, and you can take a medicine that will get rid of the stomach ache? You see, that stomach ache is actually telling you, you need to get to the doctor and have that appendix removed before it bursts and the infection from it kills you. So in our lives, dissatisfaction can be a God-given thing to tell us you're looking in the wrong place. Don't settle for something less than what God really has for you. Don't look on the outside. Don't be misdiagnosed. And what about the people of the world? who seem to have it all. Two examples. Michael Jackson. He died at 50 years old after multiple surgeries to try to make himself what he wasn't. And yet the world holds him out as an example to us. I don't know about you, but I don't want to follow in the footsteps of Michael Jackson. He died at the same age I am. I like to think of that as fairly young. What about John Belushi? Some of you are old enough to remember who he was. He was a very famous actor when I was graduating from high school. He was living life in the fast lane. He was wealthy. He had been recognized. Uh, he, was, he had the number one selling musical album at the time. He was in multiple movies. And he died from a, from a heroin cocaine overdose. A miserable young man who had everything he thought would make him happy. But you see, he was looking for love. He was looking for fulfillment in all the wrong places. And what does God say? Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things you need, these things will be added to you. And so the challenge that we have is to understand what does it mean to seek God's kingdom? God's kingdom is not a place. God's kingdom is within us. In fact, when Jesus was confronted and asked about God's kingdom, he told people, he said that the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. This is in Luke chapter 17. People will not say here it is or there it is. He says the kingdom of God is within you. You see, the kingdom of God is internal. It's not external. And the kingdom of God is is spiritual. It's not something physical. The kingdom of God is transformational. Paul said that the kingdom of God does not consist of words, but it comes in power. 
You see, the kingdom of God is Christ in you. Paul wrote to the Colossians. He said, this mystery, Colossians 1, 26 and 27, that has been hidden through the ages has now been made known to the saints whom God willed that the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles would be shown to you, and that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is where our point of satisfaction, our point of hope and happiness lies. But you see, God doesn't do it the world's way. We have to pursue Him in the way He calls us to. So the key is here that the abundant life that we see comes through a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, everybody says, okay, living relationship with Jesus Christ. Probably everybody in here would agree that that's what we're supposed to have. But how are we supposed to get there? Who gets the kingdom of God? Scripture tells us first it's those who need him. Look at who gets the kingdom in the Beatitudes that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5. It's the persecuted and the poor in spirit. It's the people who have reached the end of themselves and are out of their resources. Those are the people who reach out to God and say, I need you. Those are the people God responds to. They're the people who hunger him, hunger for him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are you hungry for righteousness? There are days I wake up and I am not hungry for God, honestly. I have to ask to want to be hungry. We need to be on our knees asking over and over because, you see, God has made us so that we're like sheep. That's not a very complimentary thing. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned each one to his own way. Sheep wander away from the shepherd even when they know that their safety lies with the shepherd. Every day we have to come back. We have to get a spiritual course change and get redirected to God. Are you praying that way? Are you seeking after God? If you, try this experiment. Put your hand on something and don't move it. Pretty soon you'll notice that you can't feel it anymore. You have to move your hand to feel it. You see, we're the same way spiritually. If you, you cannot stay static, you cannot stay in the same place. You have to keep coming back. You have to keep being refilled. We are leaky vessels. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, we are clay pots because we are filled with the beauty of Christ. The world's not supposed to see us. It's supposed to see Jesus in us. But we have to constantly be being filled if we are to be what God wants us to be because we leak out from day to day. We need to be hungry for God. We also need to be seeking him. God told the Israelites right before they were carried into captivity in Babylonia, he told them, you will search for me and find me when you seek me with all your hearts. You see, God doesn't give his kingdom to those who casually are interested. It has to be your focus, your heart's desire. You have to recognize that he is the only place where you will find true fulfillment. And then we need to delight in Him. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean He's your sugar daddy, and He'll give you everything at once. It means He will put His desires in your heart so that the things you want are the things that He wants. So, how do we get there? What are we supposed to do? First thing we've got to do is we've got to cultivate a taste for the Word. You know, when I was young, I didn't like coffee. But I really admired my grandfather, and my grandfather loved coffee. So I taught myself to like coffee because I thought that was part of being a man. If you have to drink coffee, and you have to drink it black. Are you cultivating your spiritual tastes? Some things in the Word may not be something that you like naturally. But if you teach yourself, we read this in Peter, you, you need to feed on the Word. Develop a taste for it. Some kids don't like broccoli, but you know they can learn. Some of my kids may not agree, but you can learn. It is possible. You need to cultivate a taste for the things of God. 
And you do that by focusing. Yesterday, we, I was with the college group, and we talked about one of the verses they were considering for their missions verse was Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Those are two of my favorite verses. Fixing your eyes on Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now sits at the right hand of God the Father. We need to be focused. We need to prioritize. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not at the end of the day. Not after everything else is done. God has to be number one. We have to practice. You know, if you want to go to the Olympics, you can't just pick up whatever sport you're interested in and do it. It takes years of discipline and hard work. And Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians 9. You can read about it. He said, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself don't become a castaway. You see, there's always that risk that we have deceived ourselves. We need to make sure that, that our life is an example of Christ. We don't want to be those who honor Him with our lips, and yet our hearts are far from Him. We don't want to hear, God forbid, the words, depart from me, I never knew you. And we have to persevere. See, life is not a sprint. I'm sure you've heard that. It's a marathon. And the, I love the exuberance that I see in the, the college age group here. I mean, it's wonderful. And one of the, the, the things that exemplifies it was in that last song that they sing. Trust without borders. You know, when you're young, you're just gullible enough, gullible, to believe that God actually meant what he says. That when he says he's going to take care of you, he will. And you trust him. And you find out he does what he said he was going to do. You know, you get a little older like me and respectable, and you know we've got to have these boundaries. And we know what, what, what the proper way to do things is. But the reality is that I've just gotten afraid. I'm afraid to take God at his word, to trust him to do what he says. I have to persevere. I have to keep the flame that I had when I first came to Christ alive. And you guys are great, but I can tell you as you get older, you're going to face some of these same challenges. And it will be a struggle for you to keep that flame alive. But recognize that there are things along the way that will try to distract you. Don't let the enemy get your attention away from God. And it's not only the obvious sins. Often... It's the good that comes in as a substitute for the best. And so you have to avoid those things. You have to avoid exempting yourself and being misdirected. Taking the road that's close, but doesn't go to the, to the place where you need to go. And you need to avoid the false motives. Doing the right thing, but doing it for the wrong reason. You see, God knows your heart. He knows if you come to church because you love Him, or if you come to church because you know the guy you're trying to strike a deal with at the office is going to be there too. He sees your heart. Don't ever let there be a substitute for, their, for your Savior. And also recognize that God has not called you to an easy task. And He's told you it's going to be difficult. If you seek Christ first, it will be exhausting work. It will take everything you've got. I saw that last night, okay, I go to Pastor Lauren's home, and I'm crawling into bed at 10 o'clock, which for me is late, okay? Two o'clock in the morning, his wife comes in after ministering at the church. It's exhausting work. You don't see that on Sunday morning, but those are the things that go on oftentimes behind the scenes. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called The Outliers. It's a fascinating book. I recommend you read it. One of the principles in that book that he talked about was that the people that we think of as lucky successes often have the common factor that they put, on average, 10,000 hours into the thing that they're good at, whether it is Bill Gates with computers or the Beatles with music. And so should we be surprised that God would call us to something exhaustive for the kingdom of God, for eternal life, when the world around us recognizes that it has to give its all to achieve success. And we're working for an eternal crown, not for something that fades. 
and then is thrown away. God is also exclusive. He will not let you have anyone else share his place. He will not be a means to an end. God will not allow you to use him to get success or recognition. He must be the end of your life. He must be your first love. And it will cost you everything. It's expensive. In Luke, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and he doesn't hate his father and mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. If you don't forsake everything, you cannot be my disciple. Does that mean you can't have a family? No. But it means God, God's got to be number one. It's going to cost you everything. So my prayer is this morning that when you look inside that the Holy Spirit will show you those places in your heart where maybe you've drifted, where I've drifted. It happens every day. It's very hard when we're traveling to keep that focus on God the way it needs to be, to keep Him at the center point. Let's pray. And then I'll ask Pastor Lauren to come up. Lord, thank you for your word and the first your word says humble yourself in the sight of lord of the lord and he will lift you up and the first thing i want to state again is that that i'm not here because i am an example i just have the privilege of being here at this time and i pray that as as your mouthpiece that you would use the words that come from scripture to convict us spotlight the places in our heart that need to be cleaned up challenge us where we have gotten lazy or apathetic lord fan into flame our our zeal where we have grown cold and maybe frustrated and lord give us courage where me where we may have become fearful when the monsters around us when the goliaths are threatening us lord give us the heart of david who was able to take five stones and meet the killer that the whole Israel army was afraid of. And Lord, bring us to heaven, not to hear the words, depart from me, but to hear the words, well done. Lord, use the people in this room to reach liberal Kansas and beyond for the kingdom as we see it grow and as we see Christ lifted up and magnified. May it be an example to other churches of living life the way you call us to, of passion in the Lord Jesus and him alone. We ask for Christ's sake.